Hello, listeners, and welcome to Anyone Can Move. This is your host, Caroline Gerhardt. I'm so excited again to be joined by my co-host, Madison Baya, today. Hey, Madison. Hi, everyone. So we are so excited today to talk to Mrs. Susan McGreevy Nichols, and she is the executive director of the National Dance Education Organization. And, you know, I think dance education is, again, something that is just kind of there. Nobody really, like, talks about what it means or how important dance educators are, the fact that we, none of us would be here and have this passion that we do without um, the dance educators in our lives. I know for me personally, the people who taught me growing up are so much of the reason that I am still pursuing that passion with dance. And I'm sure the same goes for you, Madison, right? Oh, most definitely. Right. So um, I just loved this conversation that we had, and I'm so excited to share it with everybody. And I hope everybody can really um, take something from it and understand the hard work that these um, men and women put into bringing dance to children across the country. So without further ado, our conversation with Susan McGreevy Nichols. Great. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Anyone Can Move. I'm so excited to introduce our special guest today, Mrs. Susan McGreevy Nichols. Hello, Susan. Hi, how are you? It's I'm so good. great. How are you? Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'd love it if you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your career so they can get to know you. Well, um, I am the executive director of the National Dance Education Organization, and the vision for uh, NDEO is to um, advance dance education um, <clears throat> in, 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 in the arts, focused in the arts. So in terms of my background, I taught 28 years in Providence, Rhode Island at Roger Williams Middle School. And basically I created a program, a dance program that began with 12 people after school and then finally, at the height of my, of my career there, 600 of the 900 students in the school were involved in the dance program. So it was a big deal. Um, I actually, um, we had three full-time dance teachers. So um, it, it just put me, kind of put me in the spotlight nationally. Um, I did a lot of um, presenting, talking about my program. Um, ultimately, because when I started, um, I really don't have a, a, a strong dance background. My background's actually in PE, but I, I hire well. <laughs> so um, I learned a lot by bringing in visiting artists and, um, you know, basically learned a lot about dance. Um, ultimately, I co-authored five books. So that are, you know, using, basically, they all approach dance through the creative process. Right. So, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. When I retired after 28 years, I was hired by the Gaelic Institute to work in um, arts integration. And uh, the, eventually I moved to California and uh, did an administration uh, role for them. Um, in addition to that, I, I did a lot of um, working with the, as a teaching artist in um, LAUSD and um, working up in the um, San Francisco area. Very cool. That's incredible. That's such a great, um, I love that you don't necessarily have a dance heavy background, but you're so involved in this art form. What was that transition like for you when you first started to get involved in dance compared to the world of PE? What was that like? Um, well, I, the thing is, I, I did take dance classes in, in, in college, but, um, the, the, and, you know, to this day, I don't know how I got in PE. It's like, I never remember making that decision. It's like, how did I get in here? And, and it just, it was very team sport oriented. And I was like, oh my God, really give me a break. But I really loved the dance classes. And I was really had a knack for choreography. You know, I could see the dances in my mind. And even though I didn't have a, um, a very heavy technique basis, I was able to use pedestrian movement and actually create using pedestrian and, and learning how to get other people to create using a process that um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about later on. Right. That's incredible. So my mantra is anybody can dance. Mm -hmm. Hey, that works perfectly with our podcast. Who would have thought? Yeah, Beautiful. exactly. 
I'd love to hear a little bit about um, some objectives that NDEO has for expanding dance education. Well, in, in 2016, our um, Applied Strategic Planning Task Force developed the national priorities for dance education with the purpose of advancing dance education by promoting dance education for all. So um, NDEO has a commitment to the field. That's why the priorities are so important. Um, and they actually are a strategic plan for the field. This is the vision that needs to be the focus of everything that we do. As the field grows, so does NDEO. So the priority, the three key points of the priorities is to connect the field. Okay, we tend to silo a lot. Dance education is a very, um, it, it, it's, it's very, isolating at times. Many times in a, in a school, you're the only dance educator. You know, you, when you have a studio, you're within your community um, and, and you work so much to make ends meet that you really don't get out there with other people in the community. And the same thing for higher ed. There may be a department, but sometimes and many times there it's like a one man or two man department and a lot of adjunct going on. So, um, you know, we, it is isolating. So this is, it's important that we connect the field to make people work together. Um, in terms of, uh, the next one is build knowledge. Obviously that's one of our, it's one of our um, main aspects that we do is professional development and really help people give them the tools and um, the, uh, the way to reach out with their own knowledge through our journals and through our um, research database. So. If, if you look at what our, you know, what we do, that really is all about building knowledge. It's one of my, our key aspects. And finally, the uh, third one, the third tenet is cultivate leadership. And it's really important because dance educators are leaders in, in, in whatever place they are, they are a leader. And it's really important, again, to give them the resources and tools to in the mentoring at times, to um, become a better leader or, or to become a regional leader or to become a state leader or to become a national leader, which is what happened in my case. So it's, it's just one of those things we need to support each other in, in those respects. Um, and you know, that's, again, that's real important. So that's really where we're focusing uh, and have been focusing for the last few years. Have you always pictured yourself as a leader in any field that you've done, or have you kind of grown into that role? I, yes, I, I have always considered myself a leader because I was doing something that I wanted to do, and I had to figure out how to do it. And basically, I had to, you know, find ways to get money and find ways to, um, hire people legally through the school department. I mean, so I had to work through a um, bureaucracy and, and, and kind of figured out how to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, this was an inner city middle school with 99% minority, you know, and free and reduced lunch. And yeah. all my program ultimately was completely um, covered by, paid for by federal funds, which now there's a huge amount of federal funds for K-12 programs. And this is when you grab this because perfect example is you can pay for programs like mine, which was, you know, fully baked by that time and, and really be able to support a great program. That's so encouraging. And um, how did you develop the curriculum in the school and then kind of carry it to the NDEO program now. So how did that go about? And you mentioned the creative process and how did that kind of come uh, out? So this is my, this is, and, and cut me off if I tend to go on because this really is my, my passion. So, great so, love it. <laughs> <laughs> great. so think about, um, again, the, the 1994, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, the 2014 National Core Art Standards are framed around the, uh, the um, processes of creating, performing, responding, and connecting. And basically those are cognitive processes which 
students and people in general use to create a piece of artwork. And it doesn't matter what art form you're in, it's, it's really more or less that same thinking. So think about this. You find, you, you, you um, choose a topic, okay, a concept. You research that topic. You identify important aspects of the topic. You devise problems to be solved, ask questions, you solve problems and produce material, little little snippets of, of dance material. You kind of manipulate it using choreographic principles and finally create a piece of work. And of course, as in many things, you revise it, evaluate it, revise it, perform it, and you know, and again, think about revising and, and, and uh, reproducing it. So that's, that's the cognitive process of creating. But it also is the cognitive process of the scientific process, the problem solving process in math, and also the writing process. So all of these are related and kind of go through those same steps. So one of the things that we really uh, do from an advocacy, advocacy point of view is to show how those things are related and that thinking process goes across all disciplines. So it's really important. So I'm going to give you an example. A lot of what I did was to create dances using text. Okay, so I'm going to read you a very short text paragraph, and then I'm going to tell you how you'd make a dance out of it. This is from National Geographic, by the way. The sky was white with gannets and filled with their manic chatter. Wings folded in this to their sides, they plummeted into a sea-like feathered missiles, leaving green bubbled trails in their wakes. They were hunting sardines and the water boiled with fish. It was as if this patch of sea off the Eastern coast of South Africa had been turned into a pot of bouillabaisse and everyone was falling to the feast. Scores of circling dolphins harried the, the sardine skull into an ever-tightening mass. Panicked sardines threw themselves into the air and splashed back into the melee. So this, we are going to create a dance using a focusing question. And the focusing question is various, the dolphins, the, the, the sardines, and the um, gannets behave. And what did they do to the water? So again, through that, that um, process, you would really break down that, that word, is, actually use reading strategies to break down that, those, uh, that, that uh, paragraph. So the gannets, um, manic chatter, um, wings were folded to their, their sides and diving into the water. The sardines circled. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the, the um, dolphins circled. And the sardines panicked and made the water boil as if it was boiling. So all of these ideas, as you pull apart the text, students would create, and I actually separated them to gannet sardines and um, the water, the before, and the, the dolphins. And they would create um, a movement signature for that, for that particular character. And we put it together to create a dance. And actually using ABA choreographic structure, A would be how was the water before they came, before all this happened. Then it happened and then they all went away and you go back to A. So that's something, and, and, and so basically you just kind of, you really play with the words and, and then use um, the elements of dance to actually, because many times it comes off as very literal but then you make it more abstract by using the elements of dance. So that's kind of what this is all about. It's really making them think in a different way. And they love creating. I mean, so this is something that kids really love to do. And they're so proud of what they've created. And, and they, they don't have to have a heavy dance background. They, they can use pedestrian movements to do this. 
And I, that I love hearing about the cognitive process, how it relates to problem solving and the scientific process. I'd love to hear a little bit about how, you know, these exercises with these kids when they're taught in K through 12 schools, how it affects their traditional education, their math, their science, their, their reading. How does that, have you seen improvement in those areas when they've started to use these dance exercises? Not actual, not actual, no, I, I did when I was, um, you know, at, at Roger Williams, our sixth grade teachers worked, we worked with the sixth grade teachers and we created big production and everything was always done from text. So they basically read um, uh, like a big book on um, Shackleton's adventure to Antarctica. And we basically created a 35 minute production based on that. And each class had another, had a different responsibility to um, in a different section of this particular um, production. And the teachers, they just, they, first of all, I think you can't downplay the engagement and the exciting, the excitement. And so one of the things though we have to do as, as dance educators is we have to make it intentional because students may be, you know, freaked out by, by the math problem solving um, process or the writing process or, you know, the scientific process, although that's kind of fun many times with, with kids. But basically just taking the writing project process, you, you have to you identify a topic, you do general research, just what we did with this other you um, collect ideas and expand and expand your research. Then you begin to limit topics. You know, you have to hone it down, just like we did with the choreography. We did all this, this creating stuff. And then we said, well, we're going to use this, this, and that. Then you, you write your first draft, you self evaluate, and you rewrite. Right. And that's what you do with the choreography process, the choreographic process. And then finally, you publish and receive public comment. So that or a grade in this case. So telling kids, you know, and giving them that information gives them the confidence. Again, that can't be overrated either. Give them the confidence to say, okay, I can do this because I did this with dance so successfully. And this is, the dance is so much fun. Let's try it with, with writing. Let's try it with a math problem. So that's really how it, and in terms of um, data, research data, no, we never did a research project on it. It would have been great if we had, but, um, but the teachers were very, um, they loved it. And, and winning over teachers, classroom teachers, when they give you an hour a day of, of their time is huge, but they saw the, um, they saw the need for it. And we had a, a big bilingual, population. So again, this was really a wonderful way to, to teach them to read and to understand text when it was put together. That's wonderful. And um, yeah, so I think giving the kids the confidence to see, like, I can do this in dance, which is a lot of, it's very intimidating to non-dancers and then kind of taking that and using it to every kind of subject that's just wonderful kind of the confidence to know that you're able to do that and then also having the piecemeal things of the creative process that helps you do that and that's wonderful so you have kind of an understanding of the broad scope a little bit of our national education with dance so as you see that and you see dance education in a lot of different areas of the US and the world, are there any areas that you see that could be improved? Yes, I, I, absolutely. Um, dance education is a very small field mm -hmm. and it's, it, and it's represented through three major sectors, um, higher education, pre-K through 12, in the private sector, which includes dance studios and dance companies that have an education arm uh, and community arts organizations. So we have these three uh, sectors. It's really important that these sectors collaborate instead of operating like solo, silos rather. Mm -hmm. There is so much to gain by working together. All sectors have a purpose to serve and it is imperative, imperative that they respect each other with those purposes in mind. They're not competitors. They need to work together. 
So it's, uh, I'm, that's kind of my other platform that I'm always preaching about is how important it is for, you know, for advanced educators really to work together. So you, you have meetings with higher ed and, you know, studio people in the community and uh, community artists and K-12 and you work together and you have conversations and you solve problems and you, you know, present problems. I mean, that's what's really important right now that you're able to do that. And that's, I mean, it definitely makes sense. I feel growing up as a competition dancer when I got to college for dance and realized there's this whole other world of dance education that I had no clue even existed just because I wasn't exposed to it until middle, late high school, have you seen areas where private sector and higher education or K through 12 have worked together and how, what the result has come from that? No, not, no, again, not, not um, specifically, um, you know, we, we have annual conferences and again, people get together and, and they have, um, they, um, you know, they meet together. So um, I'm, I teach, we have an online professional development institute. And in those courses, we have, we have everyone from all sectors. We have people who have, who have um, a high school degree to people with a PhD who are in the course with, um, with studio people and with K-12 people and with higher ed people. And it's, it's, that has been a wonderful, supportive community, having them respond to each other, you know, to give feedback um, through our, our um, discussion forum. So that's been really very, um, really very revealing to me that, that, that they're not sniping each other or not feeling, and that happens. I hate to say it, but it happens. Is this kind of this, oh, uh, well, higher ed is, you know, they think they're so superior, they're academic, you know, oh, competition studios, you know, they, that's all they care about. And, you know, it's not always appropriate. And, you know, this, that stuff going back and forth. And it's like, okay, just, can you find common ground somewhere? That's what you need to do. So um, it's, you know, it's, it, those are one of the things, again, that we're trying to to solve, but you know, actual research data, well, no, not maybe, maybe someday. Yeah, no, but that make, and I mean, that makes perfect sense too, because one we've talked about our kind of theme for this season of um, the podcast is kind of revealing things that people don't talk about in dance. And I feel like that's a big thing that nobody acknowledges that there is this kind of unspoken competition between higher education mm -hmm. and K through 12 and comp, especially competition, you know? And so that, um, acknowledging that and just saying with this would be so much better if we all just worked together because our goal is all the same we all have the same passion and we all just want to perform so if we all could work together and expose more generations to that like what could we do the possibilities would be endless absolutely right absolutely it's so important most definitely. And you mentioned a little bit about, you know, the confidence that these, including dance education has given these students. I'd love to know what the most rewarding part of your job has been so far. Well, I mean, obviously this job, the, my, my K-12 job, it was extremely rewarding. Uh, you know, I have students that I made a tremendous, again, this is inner city, you know, backing up our school backed up to the projects. And they had no other dance situation. They came to me with no, you know, no technique, no, no dance background, but we had an incredible situation. I had performing groups of like a hundred kids. I had an African dance, you know, troupe, an African drum group to accompany them. I mean, there was an amazing, the amount of things that went on. And that was so rewarding to me to, to do two big concerts a year and, and then tour them around the state. I mean, it's a little state, Rhode Island, little state, but it, it was it was really incredible and a, an, an incredible experience for these kids to be able to get on the bus, pack everything up, get off the bus, re, you know, look figure, look at the performance space, reset the piece that they have to to a smaller space or a bigger space, figure out which is right, which is left. Uh, it was an amazing. Um, oh, so and so didn't come, and finding someone to fill in that spot. All of this was, again, part of the incredible process and the discipline that it takes in order to do that. Oh, also, they had to keep their grades up in order to come, you know, take the day out of school to go and do a performance. 
Yeah, no, of course. But well, that was, I mean, obviously, in my current job, um, our, we have amazing, amazing members. And I used to, you know, before COVID, I did a lot of traveling um, and, you know, not so much anymore. Um, and we're still doing virtual conferences. So we're not, we're not in a space where we want to go out and take risks with, you know, being the, uh, the, the hot spot for COVID, you know, where everyone caught COVID. So, um, you know, we're not ready for that yet. But really, members are innovative. They're persistent. We also, uh, I use, and I still am, helping states with certification issues. Um, you know, now kind of do it through Zoom and, and work with state departments of education if um, there are problems with getting certification, because not all states have, have a dance certification for K-12, um, or just advocacy issues that come up and, and to help support the field in general with those advocacy issues. And finally, connecting people, individuals, um, to people who can help solve their problems. So I, I, I'm a big connector. I connect people. So that's, you know, that's something I enjoy doing. So it's just like, hey, here's this person, that person. Here you go. Nice. And you seem like you connect a lot of people <laughs> with experiences because you said the inner city kids. And I can imagine they probably weren't able to take those opportunities to go and see more of more of the world and um, giving them that opportunity is absolutely wonderful for them to have that experience and then to grow them as a person, having that experience of what it looks like to be in a different place and to interact with different people. And so interaction and in dance is so important and interacting and understanding other people's stories. And we have the pandemic this year or past two years basically so how have you continued to grow people's connections and collaborations and fostered growth in your programs at NDEO and things through the pandemic <laughs> what has that looked like obviously you know we've we've written a lot of um tools documents that help that help we we did a lot of webinars mm -hmm. to um with our members I mean we have again, members that are so smart. So we've run um, a lot, you know, a webinar series, a COVID webinar series where people basically kind of, okay, this is how I fix this problem, you know, try this very hands-on type thing. Again, doing it through Zoom. Um, just, uh, you know, having panel discussions, having, you know, I, again, we've had, we did, I think 26 webinars um, wow. over a period of time to help our members. We created um, a toolkit going back to, you know, going back to the studio in, in 2020, this type thing. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we do to keep people um, kind of aware of what, of, you know, what's going on and again, how they, they're, um, how they can be focused. Um, in, in terms of becoming, we really help people become, and not just dance people, becoming an advocate for, for dance education and, and to learn more about the value of dance education. That's really important. You can't assume, first of all, you can't assume that your students understand the value of their dance education. You have to, you have to be very um, in, implicit about teaching that to, to your students, making them understand how it's making them a better learner. You know, what is it they're getting out of this dance class that you don't see? It, it's not necessarily that performance up on the stage, but how did you get there? And what did you learn by getting there? And, and that's really very important. So, you know, we do a lot of advocacy tools. In fact, I just did a, a, an advocacy wor a workbook, um, workshop for Unity, which is Unity is an organization of organizations and it's mostly private sector. Um, members who belong, um, organizations that belong to Unity. So that was, you know, that was very successful. Um, and again, that's something that is really important to have. I'd love to hear a little bit about how, sorry, oh goodness. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you mentioned like your members are so encouraging and so persistent and dedicated, how dance educators or dancers in general can get involved in NDEO. Well, again, you know, by becoming a member, but I, I think one of the biggest things that we're, we're 
doing right now, which is very imp important. The, the Black Lives Matter movement caused us to look at ourselves as an organization and consider the, sy the systemic racism has caused an imbalance in our membership. We're 74% white women. And why is this the case? Where are we really serving the field? This prompted NDEO to implement a, an, an initiative with Maryland nonprofits called Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, or JEDI. This year-long um, initiative involves an audit of all our programs, systems, ser services, and structures using an equity lens. So 90 members have been divided up into nine groups and they're using a series of questions and looking through all these artifacts that we have collected in the various categories. And um, oh well, on, on September 23rd, we're going to kind of he hear the first round of what has been found and, and kind of this collective, idea, collective ideas and consideration of these 90 members. And then in December, we ha will have an actual plan that we will begin to look at and how we are going to kind of, you know, fix or make adjustments to make things less inaccessible. I just, I have to commend you and your organization for that because that is so rare nowadays. It's, this has happened across our nation and has been happening for way too long. And instead of you just acknowledging the fact that that was your percentage and those were your numbers and just being like, well, we'll do better. We'll work on it. Putting a plan in action and acknowledging that and working to change it is just so commendable and is definitely the example that our country needs right now to implement that in every organization, business, community that we can to make things accessible, everything, not just dance, every art, every bit of education accessible to all people, no matter race, religion, culture, anything. That is just an incredible step that y'all have taken. And, and we thank you very much. And, and you know, we know it's not gonna happen overnight, but we are committed to making these changes. So, you know, we're just diving in tore the Band-Aid off, and we're going to make the fixes that we need to, to do. Yes, and listening, is, I just hear the theme of listening and taking in your surroundings and understanding the people that you're working with and then increasing your listening throughout the process to be able to have those inputs in your mind to go forward. And that's listening is a collaboration in itself. And I, I really love that and appreciate that. So um, with your organization, do you have any plans or thoughts in place on how to balance financing your organization, but also making it extremely accessible to every type of person? That's a $100 whatever question. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and our, I mean, okay, we, we keep our doors open, not on and membership alone, but we have to, we, we have our programs. We sell our programs and that's what really keeps our, our doors open. So it's, it, it's a huge, and, and we know that people, well, why can't, you know, why can't we go for free? And why can't we, you know, why, why does that, and our programs are not expensive at all. And our, our membership's not expensive, but there are still people who can't afford some of these things. So how do we balance that? Um, you know, we're, Dance education doesn't necessarily get a lot of donations. We have a, a tremendous um, foundation that does support us. The Anho Foundation um, does support us financially, but um, you know we still have to are going to have to figure out ways to make this accessible. But still, we need to charge for some, for the, the programs that that we have because we can't live on membership alone. It's just not enough money. So anyway, that's, that's our challenge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely our challenge. And, and hopefully we can get more foundations to support us in this endeavor because that's really what it's going to take. So I've got my work cut out for me. I would love to know, um, we have a lot of different types of people who listen to this podcast, but I would love if you could share a little bit of advice to 
young dance educators or dance educators in general or dancers who hope to become educators one day, just some advice from you from your experiences in this industry. Really, you know, just again, don't don't try to get your little tribe together, get, you know, work with a group, um, you know, join a local organization, join, you know, certainly join NDO, believe me, it's not that expensive. Um, because you need to have that network and you need that support. You need those ideas. Um, is That's really important. Um, we have our 23rd annual um, dance education national um, conference coming up October 7th through 10. The title is Telling Our Stories. So again, um, it's, it's too late just to um, submit a proposal, but by all means attend, it is again, at, it's virtual. So if you go on to ndeo.org, you can register there, but it certainly, and, and we have for a virtual conference, we have a pay what you can, but you have to be a member in order to, to get that pay what you can um, price rather. And so um, for, the future of NDEO and just your influence, do you have any kind of thoughts of where you would like the program to go within like say the next 10 years? Um, honestly, to, to, to really change that 74% stat um, mm -hmm. and, and making it more diverse. And again, I know it's not gonna happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this kind of, you know, this is a, a sticky initiative because there are people who who get angry, um, and and say, you know what, I'm I'm not I'm not staying with this organization because I I don't like where they're going, and you know, and that's just something you have to face. So hopefully things will balance out. Um, you know, that's that's the hope, is that we will become a more diverse organization. Well, Susan, thank you so much for having such a candid conversation with us today. I appreciate your honesty and just your willingness to share so much. I feel like I've learned a lot and been enriched so much. And I just thank you so much for being here with us today. I'd love it if you could just re um, reiterate some of those upcoming events that NDA, excuse me, NDEO has coming up and where we can follow y'all on Instagram, social media. Ah, okay. Um... Uh, um, I guess if you just Google NDEO Facebook and, you know, Instagram and all that, you can, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that, okay. um, that information, but, you know, our website, excuse me, is www.ndeo.org. And I think you can click on the Facebook and Instagram and all that through that as well. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's always, you know, we, we do have a, you know, we have a social media person that's really wonderful and gets the stuff out there really quickly. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. We appreciate, I just love this conversation and thank you for sharing so willingly. You thank are you welcome. So thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye. Oh my goodness. Well, I just absolutely loved getting to meet and talk with Susan. I just think that so many of the things that we talked about were so important and, um, I loved that her goal for the organization in the future is really focusing on diversity and improving um, that, you know, that kind of statistic that she mentioned to us. And I think that it's really exciting that she was able to share that with us and we can kind of, you know, her sharing that with us proves that they want accountability. And so I love that we can keep up to date with that. And um, I don't know about you, but I feel like just ready to go teach and ready to go learn from people. And oh, yeah. And she was such an inspiration to actually put things into action because it's so hard as dancers because we have so many ideas and passions and um, visions, but talking to somebody that's actually taken the step to make these things happen is extremely inspirational. And also I'm kind of like, okay, now I need to take it upon myself to act in the ways that I see that I need to, to grow my artistry and to grow the community around me. Right. And I think some, so much of that, the, her putting it into action is also, she didn't say it explicitly, but leading by example, like those kids, I'm sure saw how passionate she was about this and are going to put that into whatever they choose to do with their own lives. And that's just 
so it just warms my heart and makes me so excited for the, these future generations of dancers and what they're going to bring to the table. Well, I just, I hope that everybody was able to get something from this today that you didn't learn something new and maybe be inspired by something that you heard to go pursue something that you didn't think you could do. Well, as always, listeners, remember to keep moving, stay curious, and stay confident.